Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second Research Design and Analysis Core Seminar of the academic year. The topic of today's talk is Successful Conduct of Biomarker Studies, Clinical and Statistical Aspects, and will be presented by Dr. Wendy London. Dr. London is the Faculty Director of the Survey and Data Management Core here at Dana-Farber and co-director of the Research Design and Analysis Core under the U54 Partnership. She's an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, director of biostatistics medicine, Boston Children's Hospital, and director of the clinical translational investigation program within the Department of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Dana-Farber Children's Hospital Cancer Center. Dr. London received a PhD in biostatistics from Virginia Commonwealth University. She is a member of the American Statistical Association, International Society for Pediatric Oncology, and American Society for Clinical Oncology. Dr. London has three primary research interests, neuroblastoma, prognostic stratification, and design of clinical trials. One housekeeping note um, before I turn it over to Wendy. For those viewing remotely, please feel free to submit questions to my email address. And that address is on all the announcements. It was on the reminder email that came uh, to you with the web link. And it's carol underscore Lowenstein at dfci.harvard.edu. I'll monitor my email, and if any questions come in from outside, we'll post them to Wendy. So, Wendy. Thank you, Carol. Welcome to all of you who are here in person, as well as to the viewers uh, online uh, at Dana-Farber and UMass Boston. Thank you very much for uh, uh, coming this afternoon. So today I'd like to talk to you about biomarkers, you could also call them uh, correlative studies. And uh, a biomarker measures uh, and distinguishes in a precise way and reproducibly and objectively uh, either a normal biologic state from a pathologic state, and we can call this a disease-related biomarker. Examples of these would be using uh, cholesterol uh, as a biomarker for uh, heart disease and PSA screening for prostate cancer. Um, we could also use a biomarker uh, to distinguish a pharmacological response to a specific therapeutic intervention. So this would be a drug-related biomarker, uh, for example, a KRAS mutation. So good markers, biomarkers are chosen based on a hypothesis. So uh, we can uh, clearly define them. Uh, for example, if uh, you were looking for a biomarker in stem cell transplant, it might not be so clear to say chimerism, but if you uh, could uh, exactly uh, measure the proportion of donor T cells, that would give you a less, um, it would give you a more uh, uh, clear definition. You can quantify biomarkers, so binary biomarker might be the absence or presence of a mutation. Uh, or from a continuous biomarker standpoint, uh, the expression level of a particular gene. You should be able to measure uh, the biomarker on each experimental unit, whether it's a patient or a mouse, and it should measure the effect of interest and be appropriate within the context of your disease uh, or the biology that you're studying. So let's look at the functional definitions. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this is at, according to the regulatory guidelines uh, put out by the, by the NCI. So um, uh, we can look at um, uh, predictive biomarkers uh, that uh, predict outcome uh, to a specific therapy. We'll talk about this more in a minute, but these are the biomarkers that are used for uh, targeted therapies. A prognostic biomarker correlates with outcome uh, regardless of what subgroup of biomarker it is. Uh, diagnostic biomarkers can be used to uh, screen patients at the time of diagnosis to determine treatment intensity uh, and uh, um, to determine the support or the actual diagnosis. 
uh, pharmacodynamic biomarker can confirm uh, the biologic activity um, and uh, it's, uh, it's and quantify the pharmacodynamic effects uh, of a particular treatment. So if, uh, if you're thinking of applying for a grant uh, to, the, uh, to the NIH, um, they will uh, think of your, they will want to classify your biomarker into one of these three categories. Um, so from a regulatory standpoint, uh, biomarkers are classified as integral, integrated, or exploratory. So if you're running a clinical trial, and you want to include a biomarker that uh, selects your patients, determines the patient's treatment, and is performed in a clean environment, uh, that biomarker will be classified as integral, and you'll be able to obtain NIH funding in your trial uh, for that biomarker. Now, if your biomarker is, is not quite clear ready, it's not, quite, uh, it's not being used in a free environment, but it's, it's getting ready to be used, uh, and you use it to describe your patients, provide evidence, your path, pathway activation, uh, and to quantify the pharmacodynamics, that's an integrated uh, biomarker. And you may be able to obtain funding if you're using, if you're testing this biomarker in a research study. Um, but um, um, it will have to be only in a research environment. Now, from an uh, exploratory biomarker is one where you're just looking for some preliminary evidence. Everything's descriptive. It's not validated or fit for any treatment purpose. Um, and it can be, in, it, for example, uh, studies of crosstalk between uh, RAS, RAF, MEC, uh, and uh, PI3 kinase signaling cascades. So, a little test question. Um, so, which of the following does not describe the characteristics of a good biomarker? Uh, the proposal would be hypothesis driven and, and unambiguously defined, that's one. Two, meets the NCI's minimum regulatory criteria for initial biomarker testing. Three, has a quantifiable measure and the measure captures the effect of interest. Uh, four, is appropriate within the context of disease biology. And five, can be measured within each experimental unit. Okay, so which one of these does, is, does not describe the characteristics of a good biomarker proposal? I'll give you a second. Show of hands for number one. Anybody for number two? Anybody for number three? Come on, show of hands here. Anybody for number four? Number five? Come on, you guys. All right, it was kind of a trick question. The answer is number two. Uh, number one, three, and four are all the things I described to you that are in part important for a good biomarker proposal, but the NCI doesn't have any minimum criteria. It's up to you to make sure that your biomarker proposal has all the components that it needs uh, to be a solid experiment. So today we're going to be um, talking about biomarkers in the context of outcome and we'll use visual displays of outcome uh, with Kaplan-Meier curves. So um, uh, for a Kaplan-Meier curve, the endpoint is time to event. And the curves we'll be looking at today are going to look at time either from diagnosis, uh, starting from diagnosis or enrollment, and if it's event-free survival time, we'll measure from uh, until the occurrence of a relapse or a progression of the cancer. And uh, if the event is death, we'll be uh, calculating the time from diagnosis enrollment until the occurrence of death. So um, if we uh, were to conduct a clinical trial of 60 patients, and we had 30 patients on treatment A and 30 patients on treatment B, um, but each patient, uh, each treatment had 10 deaths. What do you think? Do you think that means that treatments A and B are the same? Well, they could be, but it depends. It depends on how long it takes for those events to occur. <laughs> so if in this example, the treatment B patients die more quickly than treatment A, then even though we had 10 deaths in each group, um, they are not uh, the same in terms of the outcome produced by these treatments. So let's look at this a little more carefully. So remember, we have 30 patients, and um, this y-axis is the proportion uh, of patients that are still alive. 
The x-axis is time, starting from trial enrollment and following the patients for up to six years. So each time a death occurs in a treatment group, um, this curve is going to go down one step. And the height of the step it goes down is proportionate to the number of patients uh, uh, who are still alive. So in the very beginning of treatment B, we have 30 patients alive. One of them dies. And then this first step right here will be, uh, go, will be the height of the step will be 1 30th of the entire height here. It will be um, 1 30th because um, the step height is proportionate to the number of patients uh, uh, who die over the number of patients who are still alive. And you can see that even though there are 10 steps in each of these curves, because the steps happen more quickly in treatment B, we end up with a Kaplan-Meier curve that's lower for treatment B than it is for treatment A. And so Kaplan-Meier curves provide this very nice ability to visualize the time to event or death and allow us to make comparisons uh, between uh, two treatment groups, uh, even if they're the same number of deaths, by taking into account information about the time to death. So keep this in mind because all of our examples going forward about biomarkers are going to make use of Kaplan-Meier curves to compare the effect of the biomarker or compare the effect of the treatments. So here are some examples from neuroblastoma that show some um, highly prognostic biomarkers that we use at the time of diagnosis to stratify treatment. So you can see in these Kaplan-Meier curves, there's the one curve that's lower than the other, and that's for the biomarker that has the worst outcome. So older patients, patients with stage 4, patients with MCAN amplification, and patients with unfavorable histology, all of these biomarkers uh, are prognostic of worse outcome in neuroblastoma. So I'd like to share with you some concepts that um, were published um, by Dr. Bill Kalin uh, in Nature Review. So uh, Bill is a highly esteemed uh, uh, laboratory scientist and cancer researcher here at uh, Dana-Farber. <coughs> so if you're looking for a biomarker signal uh, and, you get a, and you measure something that's really, really big, um, it doesn't necessarily mean your signal about your biomarker is robust. So robustness is the ability to withstand perturbations. So if you can conduct your experiment over and over and over again, and you still see this large effect <coughs> of your biomarker, um, then, then your biomarker signal is robust. So robustness uh, describes the, de the degree to which your finding uh, about your biomarker holds true over a, a wide range of experimental conditions. And the, and the more experimental conditions you can try and still see that biomarker signal, the more it tells you it's, that it's likely uh, that in the real world you'll still be able to, to see that signal and utilize the, the biomarker clinically. Now let's talk about causation versus correlation. So if we know that two things um, are associated or correlated, um, we want to try and understand uh, whether or not that relationship uh, has a, a causative relationship. So if, if we know A and B are correlated, there's a, a lot of different scenarios that could be true. Uh, we know that uh, A could cause B, or perhaps it's B causes A. Uh, another possible circumstance could be something completely external, call it X, this external confounder. X causes A, and X causes B. But as you can see, uh, even though there's this association of A and B through X, uh, B and A have no causative relationship to one another. And then, of course, um, it, it could be that A and B are simply correlated by chance. Now, this can happen uh, if you're conducting an experiment where you're testing a large number of biomarkers at the same time. Um, and it's important in, in, this, uh, in this situation, uh, from a statistical standpoint, to adjust your p-value for multiple comparisons. Um, because uh, if you say you test uh, 100 biomarkers, um, uh, you may identify associations that are, are not true. They occur by chance. But if you adjust your p-value to be smaller, then you may um, reduce your chances that you've identified something by chance. Um, and 
uh, and even still, uh, after doing a large panel like that, you're going to have to validate your biomarker in, in separate studies in an independent uh, cohort. So if A is necessary for B, that implies that if A is not true, then B is not true. However, A is sufficient for B implies that if A is true, then B is always true. So let's take these necessity and sufficiency uh, concepts and think of them uh, in terms of this statement overheard at a scientific meeting. Uh, BRAF is not a good target in melanoma because BRAF mutations are, are also found in benign eva. Well, that only means that BRAF mutations are not sufficient to cause malignant melanoma, but the more important question is whether BRAF activity is necessary for the maintenance of BRAF mutant melanomas. So here's, here, here's those survival curves uh, that we were uh, learning about a minute ago. So again, um, this is the proportion of patients that are alive, and this is um, observing those patients over time. Uh, these patients are, um, have chronic lung disease. So we've divided them into two groups, the patients who never needed a ventilator and those who needed a ventilator. And you can see here this Kaplan-Meier curve is lower, indicating that those who needed a ventilator had worse outcome. So let's think about our causation again. Does this mean that um, patients uh, who uh, were on a ventilator, that a ventilator caused them to have worse outcome? We would never, we would never think that. Um, it, it, instead, uh, being on a ventilator is a biomarker for uh, advanced lung disease. So now let's think. Now let's think about this same type of example with a different biomarker. Uh, HIF, HIF um, is uh, hypoxia upregulates HIF. So in, within uh, patients who are hypoxic, we can measure those who have uh, high HIF and those who have low HIF. And from these Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that the patients with high HIF have, uh, have, have worse outcome. So now let's try and understand what the possible combinations uh, of, of circumstances could be that would uh, result in, in this observation about outcome and, and high versus low HIF as a biomarker. So one possible sequence of circumstances could be that um, the patient <coughs> has hypoxia, which upregulates HIF-1, and then that results in aggressive tumor growth. That's one possible series of circumstances. It could also be that the patient has aggressive tumor growth, and that results in hypoxia, which then upregulates HIF-1. Well, what if there's hypoxia that, that uh, creates aggressive tumor growth, and then the hypoxia also up, upregulates HIF-1? So in this case, uh, this is the situation we were talking about before, where you have this external confounder that uh, causes the HIF-1 and causes the aggressive tumor growth. But here you are trying to figure out what the relationship is to HIF-1 and outcome, and HIF-1 and, and aggressive tumor growth. And if, it's, and if this is the set of circumstances, then there's no causal relationship between HIF-1 and aggressive tumor growth, and yet, and yet we would still observe these uh, Kaplan-Meier curves. So we just have to be very careful in interpreting our biomarker uh, when, uh, when we look at, at outcome and Kaplan-Meier curves. So in summary, being associated with poor prognosis is neither necessary nor sufficient for being a good cancer target. And Bill Kalin says, uh, when you're in the lab or when you're doing a clinical trial, the least interesting explanation for your data is the explanation until you prove it otherwise. Okay, let's, let's circle back and, and talk some more about um, different types of biomarkers. So um, on the left is an example of a prognostic biomarker. So in the green curves here in the middle, uh, we have all patients, and we can see that um, uh, 
uh, this particular therapy, we have a, a group of, of patients who, who, um, um, are, are, um, who don't receive the therapy uh, and have worse outcome than the patients who get the new therapy. So this top curve um, is the, are the responders to the therapy. So now let's divide the patients into two groups, biomarker positive and biomarker negative. Okay, and again, we're going to give the therapy uh, to uh, this group, and we can see that um, a group of patients within the biomarker patients is responsive to therapy, and then there's another group that isn't. And it's exactly the same difference within the biomarker negative patients. So the point here is that this particular biomarker is prognostic because no matter what treatment you give, the effect of of the treatment is the same, the treatment difference is the same, uh, whether it's in the biomarker positive group or the biomarker negative group. Now let's look at an example of a predictive biomarker. The biomarker we're studying is um, circulating tumor uh, cells, CTC. Um, and we've got four curves here, so the um, solid lines are with bevacizumab, the dotted lines are without bevacizumab. So let's just look for a moment at the blue curves. So in the blue curves, we have a high circulating tumor cell count. And, um, and if we compare the curve without bevacizumab, you can see that uh, with the addition of bevacizumab within patients that have high CTC, there is an effect of the bevacizumab, whereas in the red curves, all the patients would have low CTC, um, the bevacizumab uh, curves with and without lie over top of uh, each other, indicating that there's no benefit, uh, there appears to be no benefit of bevacizumab uh, within patients with low levels of circulating tumor cells. So this is suggesting that uh, high pretreatment circulating tumor cells may have a predictive interaction with the bevacizumab treatment. And in this case, uh, that would mean that the CTC uh, was a predictive biomarker. So let's talk some more about these quantitative interactions within a predictive biomarker. So in a quantitative interaction, when you give um, the, the treatment uh, by biomarker subgroup, all the patients would benefit, but the degree to which they benefit will be different. So let's um, look at our, our biomarker subgroups. Um, interleukin-6 high is this Kaplan-Meier plot, and inter six, interleukin-6 low is here. And so you can see uh, that the uh, patients who got pizopinib uh, have a much better outcome than uh, the patients who received uh, placebo. Uh, however, uh, when we look in interleukin-6 low, uh, pizopinib, uh, although it's a uh, it's still uh, better than the placebo patients. Um, the, the separation between the curves is less, uh, so there's less of a treatment effect within the interleukin uh, six patients than the interleukin uh, hot low patients than in the, uh, the high patients. And so there's a treatment effect. It's in the same direction. All patients benefit, but the degree differs uh, with a greater effect within the high patients than in the low patients. So now let's talk about that. So that was a quantitative interaction. Now let's talk about qualitative interactions. So in, the, in a qualitative, some of the patients don't benefit. So here we have EGFR mutation positive patients and EGFR mutation negative patients. So uh, the gefitinib patients have uh, the, tr the outcome advantage uh, over the carboplatin paclitaxel patients in the positive patients, but in the negative mutations, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, the carboplatin and paclitaxel patients have better outcome than those who receive gefitinib. So this is a qualitative interaction. So some of the patients, uh, meaning the ones with, in this case, uh, the ones with EGFR mutation negative, don't benefit from the gefitinib. <laughs> so let's talk about um, some of the issues that um, arise with um, testing for biomarker. Um, you, uh, from a statistical standpoint, you can make your sample size large, and if it's very large, you'll be able to detect a difference uh, between your biomarker subgroups, in whatever your endpoint is. Perhaps it's uh, 
the difference between cat and Maya curves. Um, and you can get a significant p-value, but even if you've done that, you have to look at that difference and see if it's large enough to be clinically meaningful. And so um, in, in some uh, of the breast cancer trials, we know that there are thousands and thousands of patients, um, and they are able to detect a 3% difference in the, uh, in the Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, and that is clinically meaningful because there are so many women with breast cancer. But in a rare pediatric tumor like neuroblastoma, we would only consider something as large as 10% as being clinically meaningful and actionable to move uh, a new treatment forward. Um, so when you're measuring your um, uh, biomarker, again, uh, it could be um, a binary endpoint, presence or absence of mutation, something continuous like level expression, or a percentage like a proportion of donor T cells. So for whatever you're measuring, it'll be important to, e <clears throat> to either gather from the literature uh, some information about the variability of the biomarker measurement, or to uh, actually uh, perform those measurements yourself to, uh, to get some preliminary data. Uh, you may need it for future power calculations to know this uh, variability. Anything that you learn about your biomarker uh, can only be applied uh, to the same patients in which you originally studied the biomarker. So if your experiment, your trial has eligibility uh, requirements, you will only be able to make inference of your results to the same population that fit those eligibility criteria. So many biomarkers come from specimens uh, in patients. Uh, sometimes you're doing studies in mice and in and those or other laboratory animals, and those specimens will be readily available. But it's a it's a, a little more of a challenge uh, to obtain specimens uh, from uh, patients. So uh, you must address feasibility issues. Uh, number one, whether or not you can get a sufficient quantity of the specimen at each time point in your study, if you're following the patients over time. Um, and then at any given time point, uh, it's, uh, you have to determine whether or not you'll be able to uh, obtain a sufficient number of patients, and that's a compliance issue. And then uh, at each time point for each specimen, will there be a, a sufficient quality of the specimen to uh, obtain a result from the assay. So my advice regarding specimen collection is to minimize the number of time points because you're going to have much better compliance uh, the fewer times you go and ask for a bone marrow specimen, for example. Um, minimize the amount of specimen required to the absolute necessary to perform the assay. You can request more of the specimen uh, as optional. Um, and then uh, the investigator will have to provide oversight of the specimen shipping procedures. Uh, very careful instructions about what kind of tubes to collect the specimens in, um, what temperature they should be shipped at. Oh, the shipping procedures are very important or you'll end up uh, having uh, the central lab receive uh, specimens that are too far degraded to analyze. Uh, in planning your study, you'll have to decide how expensive uh, the assay or test is for the biomarker. They may, that may uh, limit you from a feasibility standpoint uh, if you don't have a lot of, of, of funding. Um, and, and if you don't have a lot of funding, one alternative you could consider to get um, data on your biomarker is to look at um, bank specimens uh, for those patients. So here's some uh, ways you can avoid some pitfalls. Um, so uh, uh, I'm a statistician by training, so I'm a little biased here, but I encourage you to, um, to uh, talk to your statistician about your biomarker aims in your study rather than uh, throwing them onto your proposal at the last minute because uh, it'll be obvious to the reader if you haven't worked with um, someone from a quantitative standpoint to, um, to do the power calculations and to, and to do the study design for testing your biomarker. Uh, oftentimes, um, uh, proposals will come with biomarker studies that are underpowered. Um, and then it's just a, a waste of time and money because you won't be able to get an answer. Um, you have to have an adjustment for multiple testing. If you're testing a whole panel of biomarkers, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be right to be able to just point to the one with the lowest p-value and say, aha, that's it. You're going to have to validate this going forward. 
Um, and a big problem uh, that we have in multi-center trials or even single institution trials is lack of compliance with specimen submission. And so you have to uh, be very realistic in estimating maybe only uh, 70, 60, 50 percent of the time the specimen will actually be submitted uh, in terms of what you might hope versus reality. And now we're going to talk about how to avoid bias in measuring, uh, measuring your um, biomarker. So bias is the systematic difference between what we think we observe and what we should actually observe. I mean, we'd love to observe the truth. So we're, we're all assuming that we're going to observe the truth, but we never observe the truth. It's close to the truth, but because we're sampling from a population, there's, there's some bias in there. We're not going to always get a representative sample of the population. Uh, and so the more haphazard uh, we are about collecting data, the more chance that we have that that sample we take is biased. And we can't quantify bias when, when a study, and it doesn't matter how big your sample size is, uh, if you have a problem with bias. Um, you know, uh, even a larger sample size won't help eliminate bias. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about some examples um, where uh, bias could creep in uh, to your biomarker study. So let's just say you're looking to get some, some cancer uh, patients and also some control. So if all your can available cancer subjects happen to be male, and then you end up with a population of, of healthy controls that are primarily female, you have a bias there in terms of sex. You won't know if the difference between the biomarker controls and the biomarker cancer subjects is due to the biomarker or due to the fact that uh, due to the difference in sex. Uh, when you're collecting your specimens, um, if you get your specimens from one clinic and your controls from a different clinic, then your biomarker may be biased uh, in terms of the conditions that exist uh, between the two clinics. Um, storing and handling your specimens, if you get your, your, can your, uh, your um, cancer specimens uh, from a, a, a freezer where they've been for 10 years, and you get your controls from a freezer that have been stored for only a year, um, then you may have a bias uh, because something has happened to degrade the specimen and change the measurement of your biomarker due to the freezer and not be, you're not really measuring a difference uh, between controls and cancer specimens. Uh, in analyzing your specimens, uh, if you're using a central lab, uh, you have to be careful not to run all your cancer specimens on one day on, on a machine. And even if it's the same machine, if you run to all the all the controls on another day, that machine could uh, vary over time, and, uh, and so as a result, um, you have a, a bias uh, due to the machine, and what you're measuring is not your biomarker after all. So in terms of analyzing your biomarker data, here's an approach that you can use to avoid overfitting your data. So we'll take the data set of all your patients and randomly divide it into a test set and a validation set. Um, and so you can train your biomarker signal on one part. So you do the entire development process in the lab from start to finish, no matter how complex it is, in the test set. And then uh, from that, you get a result on your biomarker signal. Now, you've got a locked and fixed experimental methods and statistical model, and, and then you apply that to your validation set of patients. Uh, and then measure the biomarker signal in the validation set, and that will give you an unbiased estimate of the performance of your biomarker. And then you can compare the results between the test and validation set to see how closely they match. Okay, another test question. I need full audience participation here, please. So in biomarker studies, which of the following could introduce a bias when you're comparing group A and group B? Okay, it would be biased if you excluded patients who failed to meet the study eligibility criteria. B, uh, group A specimens come from institution A and group B come from institution B. Uh, C, obtaining group A from historical biobank and obtaining group B from prospective studies. D, B and C only, or E, all of the above. Okay, ready? Let's see. Hands up for A. Hands up for B. C. D, 
All right, all the above E. You guys are right. It's D. Good job. So yeah, we would uh, uh, we would definitely want to uh, include patients, uh, exclude patients if they fail to meet the study eligibility criteria. That's that that uh, helps you identify the right patient cohort. Okay, so in biomarker studies, um, it's important to have enough power to detect uh, the effect of the biomarker. So let's just say we're uh, conducting a phase two study um, of, a, uh, of patients um, uh, treated with uh, dose-dense methotrexate and blasting doxorubicin and cisplatin, and we'll call it DDM-VAC. Um, and in this study, the primary endpoint is tumor response, but we also have um, a correlative objective on a biomarker, and the biomarker um, is the expression levels of ERCC1. And, and uh, as a sec secondary objective of this phase two study, we want to know what the association is of these uh, tumor expression levels uh, um, with, with, of the EERC expression level uh, with whether or not the patient responded. So response is a binary endpoint, response, no response, and we're going to be looking at the biomarker ERCC1 as a continuous measure of expression. So we're designing the study, and the investigator has, has the hypothesis and the hypothesis is that there's going to be a large clear difference. The investigator hypothesizes that high levels of ERCC1 um, will be associated with resistance to that uh, treatment, whereas uh, low levels of the ERCC1 expression um, will uh, produce a better response. So here you can see um, uh, a plot of the uh, expression level values for the patients expected to respond versus the patients expected uh, not to respond. And um, in this uh, scenario, there's a 55% response rate, and the planned sample size is 37. So that's the investigator. The statistician is going to take a little more realistic view and uh, uh, anticipate some, some variability here. So you can see that uh, those points are now uh, there's a, a lot more spread across the range of the expression level. Um, however, in using the Wilcoxon test to compare responders versus non-responders, there's still a significantly, a statistically significantly lower uh, ERCC1 expression level for the responders as compared to the non-responders. So that's how everybody was hoping the study would work out. So unfortunately, uh, in reality, only 27 of the 37 uh, assays were successful. You know, specimen degradation, uh, lack of compliance, all those reasons that I, I was telling you about that you were going to lose power. Well, it happened here. So down to 27, and nothing else has changed. All right, so we still have the same level of variability here as here. But we've lost a lot of, of power, and now the p-value is 0.24. So even if there was some true effect of this uh, ERCC1 as a biomarker, we're just not going to be able to detect it because we don't have enough power anymore. So that was with a 55% response rate. Now, uh, for power, if your sample size, if your sample uh, is evenly divided, half in each group, that's where your power is maximized. But the more that same group of patients is unevenly distributed between the two groups, like let's just say a really bad distribution is only had 10% in one group and 90% of patients in the other group, your power is going to be much lower. So we went from 55% response rate, so that means 45% in the other group. Now if we had only a 35% response rate, so now we've got 35% of patients in one group and 65% in the other group, so the power goes down because of that unequal distribution of the patients between the two groups. So flash you back here, so we had 0.03 and 0.24. Simply with the lower, lower response rate, we go to 0.06 and 0.6. 
So we've lost a, a lot more power um, and uh, we're unable to detect our biomarker signal um, because of that. So in, in summary, um, uh, we would look at, if you're writing a study, you want to think of all possible scenarios uh, and take this into account at the time you're designing the study. Look at the worst case scenario so you can make sure you won't get yourself into the situation of having a 35% response rate and only 27 other specimens and being underpowered. Make a table like this in your protocol and you can plan out um, the, uh, the power you need for the worst case scenario. So how can we make use of biomarkers, uh, predictive biomarkers, uh, to actually treat patients? So the number of different designs that we can use. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is called an enrichment design. So patients would enroll in a trial, we assess the biomarker, and if they're negative for the biomarker, they go off study. Um, so those patients won't be a part of the question that we're trying to answer about the biomarker and the treatment. Now all the biomarker positive patients will be randomized to either treatment A or treatment B. So this might be standard treatment and this might be some targeted therapy that you're, you're hypothesizing would work within the, the biomarker positive group. Uh, another type of design is called a biomarker stratified design. It's an all-comers design because, uh, because all the patients who enroll in the trial, whether or not they're positive or negative, remain on the study. We're not taking the biomarker negative patients off. So we assess the biomarker, then we stratify them into two groups, positive and negative, and within each of those groups we randomize to treatment A and treatment B. So this is kind of a factorial design where we can answer two different questions. We can answer one question uh, within the biomarker positive patients, uh, does this targeted therapy work um, better than the standard of care? Um, and then we can also answer the question um, for <clears throat> the treatment A, whatever it is, does treatment, how does treatment A compare uh, in, in terms of outcome for the biomarker patient, positive patients versus the biomarker negative patients because you've got them um, down here. Um, now this design is a biomarker uh, strategy design, so um, the randomization takes place without regard to what the biomarker value is. So in the um, biomarker treatment directed arm, um, uh, biomarker positive patients re receive what is probably likely a, a targeted therapy, and the biomarker negative patients receive um, the uh, standard therapy whereas um, uh, the patients in the control arm would all receive um, the standard uh, therapy. And then uh, this is a, a, um, a hybrid design or a real example of the Taylor X trial. And uh, depending on which risk group a patient is in, uh, changes how the biomarker is used to determine the patient's treatment. So all the patients register and then they use prognostic factors measured at the time of diagnosis to determine if a patient is what's in this disease, traditionally uh, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And so they put all the, the low risk patients onto just the hormonal therapy. They want to give the high risk patients some more intensified therapy with chemotherapy plus the hormonal therapy. And then in the intermediate risk patients, the question is, what's, what's needed? So they randomized them just to just the hormonal therapy and then to chemo plus hormonal therapy. So, <clears throat> uh, and, and so uh, this will answer the question as to whether the intensification is necessary within intermediate risk patients. So then there are also uh, some designs I won't go into. I'm going to give you some uh, references at the end that you can uh, read about to, uh, to look at umbrella designs. Um, and that uh, one, one umbrella design in particular um, uh, randomizes patients uh, to um, targeted therapy versus physician, physician's choice strategy. Um, and then uh, another could uh, screen a, a number of drugs um, uh, in, in specific tumor contexts. Uh, and also uh, biomarkers are, are used in adaptive designs. Um, 
Let's go to a test question. Here we go. Um, a little bit of reading here. So in a recent paper, we've got progression-free survival, some Kaplan-Meier curves uh, for YAM, yet another marker. So, so YAM is in a phase two trial of 35 patients, and, in the, and the paper reports the, the YAM only in 15 of the 18 patients that were enrolled on the trial. So we had uh, worse uh, PFS if you had high YAM. So the patients with low EM had better outcome. Uh, there was a cut point used, so it's a binary endpoint. We started with this marker, and then we used a cut point to define patients as either high EM or low EM. But that cut point wasn't uh, ever presented before in the literature. This is the first time. So the, the uh, authors of this particular paper concluded that YAM should be routinely used to stratify patients for clinical trials. So let's say your mentor reads this and uh, thinks this is a terrible idea and wants to write a letter to the editor criticizing the study. <clears throat> Which of the following would not be a part of the criticisms that the, that, that the mentor includes in the letter? So one, with, with only the advanced stage patients in the analysis, conclusions are not generalizable to all patients. Two, the choice of the cutoff is not justified. Three, studying a single marker as a secondary endpoint in a phase two trial may introduce a bias because excluded markers could also have been associated with uh, survival. And four, YAM is not ready for routine use. Okay, here we go. Show of hands. Which one of the following is not a valid criticism? One, anybody? Two, three, got some hands. Four, okay, the answer is three. So it is valid, uh, a valid concern that because um, they're just studying advanced stage patients, uh, these conclusions wouldn't be generalizable to all the patients. They're, they're providing for the first time a cut point without any uh, justification. Um, and uh, they're advocating routine use in clinical trials for YAM, and it's clearly, there's clearly not enough uh, evidence provided in this trial to support routine use. Okay, same paper. Um, and let's see, the question this time is, um, which is, which of the following is not an advisable action based on the study? So same study with YAM, um, and now, what should you do after reading, what should you not do after reading the, uh, the study? Uh, one, use high YAM as an exclusion criteria in your upcoming phase two trial. Two, uh, learn more about the reproducibility of the assay. Uh, three, incorporate only marker YAM into your upcoming phase two study as a secondary objective. Four, incorporate marker YAM and other markers that have similar levels of evidence into your upcoming phase two study as secondary objectives. So which one of these is not an advisable action on the study? One, can I see a show of hands? Okay, few hands. Two, learn more about the reproducibility. Three, wait for three. Four, good job, it is, it is one. You should, uh, you know, we have, there's just not enough evidence in this paper to begin clinically applying the, the, uh, the YAM even as an exclusion criteria. You, you don't know if what you've measured is representative and how it's affecting the population on your next trial. All right, I think this is the last test question. So, as you write your protocol, what should you keep in mind regarding correlative studies? One, as many correlative studies as possible should be included. Two, because a small sample size, correlative studies have no useful role in phase two trials. Three, missed samples will not adversely affect the interpretation of your biomarker studies. Getting most of the samples from most of the patients will be adequate. Four, design for correlative aims and collection of samples needs to be done as carefully as all other procedures of the trial. All right, show of hands for um, so which of these should you keep in mind when you're writing your protocol? Number one, two, three, four. Okay, everybody's hands are up for four. Good job. 
Okay, so let's kind of uh, wrap up, summarize uh, power calculations. You want to get an answer about your bio biomarker, you, you're probably going to power the study based on your primary objective, but then you can take whatever that sample size is and then look to see if you're going to have enough power for your biomarker studies. Um, and if you have too few, you're going to have too much uncertainty in your results. Uh, to calculate power, you need a clear statement of the objective about your biomarker, a well-defined endpoint, for example, time to uh, disease recurrence or time to death, and then uh, desired, desired precision or detectable effect size. And so these work in sequence to allow, uh, to allow us to calculate the power. And so um, for your biomarker, see if it can pass the, the test. Um, uh, can you measure it within each of your experimental units, whether it be a patient or a mouse? Um, are your measurements in your biomarker sufficiently reproducible? Uh, how much variability do you have uh, within uh, your experimental unit? Uh, how much variability do you have across laboratories? Um, how, what's the feasibility in obtaining the data about your biomarker? Will you have good compliance? And how often is your assay unable to be determined? So in summary, have a hypothesis about your biomarker, write a focused statement about the study objective, uh, review the preliminary data about the distribution and variability of your biomarker, or conduct your own experiments to obtain those data, develop a rigorous study design, and a rigorous practical plan for specimen collection and shipping, laboratory analysis, and data collection. Uh, benefit from the interdisciplinary collaboration with your colleagues who are participating in your lab or on the trial, the surgeons, the statisticians, the basic scientists, the pharmacologists, uh, and the other clinicians. So I've um, got some references here. This, um, uh, these slides will be available online. Carol, is that yep. correct? Yep. Uh, and so a um, couple pages worth of references um, if you want to do more reading on any of these topics. And I'd be happy to take questions. Yes. Um, thanks for the talk, um, Dr. London. Um, I have uh, two questions about qualitative and quantitative um, interaction. Could you go to the slides, please? Oh, sure. So in the preceding slide, just before this, one step. So this also counts as quantitative, right? Just because no separation was seen in the other category, in the other... Um, I would call it... In the other low-level category? So I, I don't think we can make any, draw any conclusions here about an uh, interaction. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not exactly in the same direction or even in the opposite direction. It's not, it's not entirely clear. I mean, these, oops. Or, yeah. these are actually nicer examples um, than, I mean, this is real world. We don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, we, don't know we, we just know that it's a predictive, CDC is a predictive biomarker. Um, and I, I'm not sure uh, whether it's a, a quantitative or a qualitative interaction. I, I'd like to study it some more before making a definitive statement on that. Thank you. And then a um, question about qualitative. Um, if you could go forward two slides. Okay. Um, so essentially the um, association was flipped. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The but direction of effect I, 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 was reversed. I'm using logic here. If yeah. you were to include an interaction, inter interaction term in a model, then you would see no effect because it's flipped, right? Be yeah, because like positive on this side and negative on this side, then you're it's not going to be significant, but you can only detect this association if you were to stratify. Basic, I mean, like, do a subset. So basically, look at the association between, right. you know, um, positive and then between right. negative. Yeah, I, I, that, that would be the way I would suggest doing it. I agree. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, just um, something to me. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, maybe I should repeat the question uh, for the folks. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry that uh, we didn't mean to forget about you guys. Um, so the question is, um, if you were modeling this in a multivariable Cox model, um, and you included a term uh, for interaction for treatment and the biomarker, um, uh, 
uh, would it be better to do this in a multivariable model, or would it be better to have two separate models and look, and look at this? And I think from a descriptive standpoint, for me, my preference would be to do the two separate models so that you can see, you can measure the actual direct effect uh, and see, uh, and be able to quantify it rather than putting an interaction term in a multivariable model. Any questions online, Carol? None so far. All right. Well, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>